attention um, I want to thank everybody for coming out today uh, this is our, our Shapley lecture this is something that we've been doing here at UH Clear Lake for and as you can tell uh, it seems to be doing pretty well uh, also uh, I'm chair of the physics department my name is David Garrison and I I do need to uh, before I introduce the speaker talk a little bit about our programs and what we do here uh, we have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a collaborative PhD program in physics. And some of the people here are actually completing the capstone in one of those programs. And uh, the, uh, at the bachelor's level, uh, which is a brand new program, we also have an engineering physics uh, sub plan, which is just now starting in the next fall. And within the master's degree, we have a technical management sub plan that some people here are working on right now. Um, with our speaker series, what we do is uh, once a year in, uh, in the springtime, uh, we bring in several different speakers, and usually at some point, usually either the beginning or uh, end of the semester, we have what we call the, the Shapley Lecture. And this is um, a lecture which is uh, sponsored by the American Astronomical Society. And so we've got some uh, materials about the, uh, from the American Astronomical Society talking a little bit about the things that they do and uh, some different programs that they have. And what they do is they basically made this possible so that we could bring in a speaker that we wouldn't normally be able to, uh, to uh, bring in. So um, I want to talk a little bit about our speaker and also want to let everybody know that if you have friends or um, acquaintances who would have liked to have been here but who couldn't for any reason, um, we do record these lectures and have them on our website. So probably by sometime tomorrow, um, there will be uh, at least an audio and, and um, PowerPoint of today's uh, lecture. So uh, you will be able to go back and, and review a lot of this stuff in case you missed anything. Now. Um, our speaker today, this is uh, Edward W. Kalb, um, and uh, most people know him as Rocky Kalb. Uh, he is the uh, Arthur Holly Compton's Distinguished Service Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics and the College and Chair of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Chicago, as well as a member of the Enrique Fermi Institute and the Kilev Institute for Cosmological Physics. In 1983, he was the founding head of the Theoretical Astrophysics Group and in 2004, founding director of the Particle Astrophysics Center at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Illinois. Uh, the field of Rocky's research is the application of particle, uh, elementary particle physics to the very early universe. In addition to over 200 scientific papers, he is a co-author of The Early Universe, the standard textbook on particle physics and cosmology. Called Research is recognized by the 2010 Denane Heeman Award for Astrophysics, awarded by the American Astronomical Society and the American Institute of Physics. He has a, a book for the general public, which is known as uh, Blind Watchers of the Sky, and in 1996, it received an award from the American uh, Astronomical Society. 
Uh, our speaker today has traveled the world giving scientific and public lectures. Rocky has been a Harold Shapley visiting lecturer with the American Astronomical Society since 1984, and he has presented public lectures at the Royal Society of London, as well as Vienna, Barcelona, Rio de Janeiro, Glasgow, Heidelberg, Valencia, Victoria, Montreal, Bonn, Karlsruhe, Rome, Toronto, Copenhagen, uh, Turin, Uppsala, Hamilton, <laughs> Vancouver, and probably several more that I don't know. Oh yeah, now Houston too. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, uh, some of you may have seen Rocky on television. He's been on several television productions, and uh, according to his bio, he's most recently interviewing Stephen Hawking for the Discovery Channel, and he can be seen in the IMAX film, The Cosmic Voyage. So with that, I'll turn it over to our speaker, Rocky Call. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here in Houston. What I'm going to talk about this evening are the mysteries of the dark universe. Now, for thousands of years, astronomers have looked up in the universe and seen what's there and in the universe by the light emitted by stars and galaxies. But I'm going to talk about things that we don't see by the light they emit. I'm going to talk about things we infer are there by the actions they have on the things that we do see. So we don't directly observe the aspects of the dark universe, but we infer they're there because we see phenomena that we can't explain by what is observed. And it's mysteries with the plural because we've divided these mysteries into uh, dark matter and dark energy. So there's a matter component that's a mystery of the universe and an energy component. And it seems to act in completely different ways. Dark matter seems to act through gravity to pull things together, to hold things together while dark energy seems to be another aspect of gravity that pushes things apart in the expansion of the universe. So one pulls dark matter, one pushes dark energy. So dark matter seems to be an attractive aspect of gravity, while dark energy seems to be a repulsive aspect. We don't know what Otherwise, it wouldn't be a mystery. We don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is. But we have a picture in our mind that we think is the best guess at this time. And the best guess for dark matter is that it is a new species of yet-to-be-discovered elementary particle, that the mass of the universe is dominated by some type of new particle that we have not yet discovered. And the best explanation for dark energy that we have at present is that dark energy is the result of a remarkable property of completely empty space. Completely empty space with nothing in it seems to weigh something. And this is an important part of the study of the universe because dark matter and dark energy seem to make up 95% of what's in the universe. So this isn't a small problem that we can just ignore. It's not round off era. It's 95% of the universe. <laughs> now, I, <clears throat> I am a cosmologist, um, often confused with a cosmetologist. <laughs> That's something different. Uh, cosmology studies the makeup of the universe. Cosmetology is the universe of makeup. <laughs> they are different. And cosmology is probably the oldest science. Not the oldest profession, but the oldest science. Every culture studied by anthropologists has, has had a cosmology. They get some idea of what's out there in space, how old the universe is, why is there a universe, why do things move the way they do. 
Why are there seasons? Why does the sun seem to rise every morning? Why does the moon go through phases? That's a cosmology. I think that only in the 20th century did cosmology become a science. So cosmology that the earth rests on the back of a turtle, and that turtle rests on a larger turtle, and that larger turtle is on a still larger turtle, turtles all the way down, that was a cosmology. It was a view of the universe. It was a cosmological model, but it wasn't a scientific cosmology. I'll argue that scientific cosmology only started in the 20th century. And one of the, one of the aspects of modern scientific cosmology is that it not only studies what's in space, it not only studies how the universe changes with time, but it is also involved with the very nature of space and time itself. Now, our everyday view of space and time, the view of space and time that we have as we, as we go about everyday life is a Newtonian or classical view of space and time. In, uh, in Newton's great book, The Principia, published in 1687, he wrote about space and time, and Newton introduced the concept of absolute space and absolute time. He wrote that absolute space uh, remains always similar, and Newton imagines absolute, true, and mathematical time, which flowed without regard to anything external. So in Newtonian physics that we experience in our everyday life, space and time is fixed. You can't do anything to change space. You can't do anything to change time. In Newtonian physics, it's a study of how objects move through space, the changes of properties of those objects over time, but space and time is a fixed playing field that physics, the laws of physics, act out of. This classical Newtonian view of space and time was revolutionized in the 20th century with the work of Albert Einstein. And he made two remarkable inferences about the nature of space and time. In 1905, when he was a third class patent clerk in Bern at the Swiss Patent Office, he looked at equations and physics that he had done during lunch hour or when his supervisor wasn't looking, and he realized that space and time were not separate. They are well relative, that they have to be related. And then 10 years later, when he was a professor at the University of Berlin, he had a further insight that space and time are related to gravity, and that the force that we interpret as gravity is due to the curvature of space by, uh, by massive bodies. So space and time are not absolute, fixed. They're relative and they can change. Massive objects can change space. Velocities can change time. Space and time are not absolute in the Newtonian picture. So Einstein just developed his new theory of gravity, which still is the best theory of gravity that we have now in 1915, in November of 1915. He soon realized that this new theory of gravity was a tool that would allow him to, to, start to understand the universe in ways that we could not before. So he used his theory of gravity to try to understand the universe. Now, in this evening's lecture, I will show one equation and one graph. You're allowed, according to the union rules of uh, lectures at 7 o'clock, to show only one equation and one graph. <laughs> and the equation I will show to you is an equation of Einstein. Now, it's not going to be E equals MC squared. Everybody's seen that. It's the equation that describes his theory of gravity, the Einstein field equations. And it, is these, it are these equations that we will use to try to understand cosmology, to try to understand the universe and the origin of the universe 
So in some sense, these equations are um, describe the origin, describe Genesis. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, experts in the audience, like David, will say, well, it looks like one equation, but this is actually a shorthand equation, a shorthand notation for 10 independent equations. So in some sense, it's the Ten Commandments of Genesis. <laughs> now, David will also uh, remind me after that although there are 10 equations and 10 commandments, uh, you only have to obey six of them just like the other Ten Commandments. <laughs> it's, you know, these are ten, pick any six. Six out of ten is a pretty good day for a lot of people. So, in fact, there's only six commandments. Now, this, these equations are complicated. They are nonlinear partial differential equations that are extremely difficult to solve, except in very special conditions. But there's one aspect of the equation I would like to, like you to take away. That is that it has a left-hand side and it has a right-hand side. That's the only thing you have to know. The left-hand side of Einstein's equations describe gravity, space and time, curvature of space, bending of space, and the expansion of space. Things related to space and time are on the left side of the Einstein equations. On the right side of the Einstein equation is all our information about the distribution of matter and energy in the universe. So the fundamental laws of physics go on the right-hand side of the equations. And what Einstein's theory of gravity is a relationship between curved space, which we interpret as gravity, and the distribution and nature of matter and radiation in the universe. And there's one constant G to remind us it has to do something to do with gravity. That's Newton's gravitational constant. So in 19, at the end of 1915, Einstein finalized his theory of gravity, and he thought it would be it would open a door on a new understanding of the universe. Now, Einstein expected, as most people did at the time, that the universe is timeless. It's ageless. It didn't have a beginning. And it always has more or less the properties that it does now. He expected to find an ageless, static universe, a universe that didn't undergo a lot of evolution or change. He was dismayed to discover that his theory that he spent 10 years developing did not have a solution that described the universe that he expected to find. So what he did was to add another term to the equation that he called a cosmological term, and there was a cosmological constant, a new constant of nature, uh, denoted by the Greek letter capital lambda. So with this new cosmological term, Einstein was able to define, to find a solution to his equations that described an ageless, timeless, static universe. Now, in the uh, 90 years or so since Einstein did this, we have made great advances in this study by moving this term to the other side of the equation, all the way, it's taken 90 years to move it from one side of the equation to the other side of the equation, and we come up with a completely different name for it. We call it dark energy, and I'll return to dark energy in a while. So this, I claim, was the first scientific cosmology. Einstein developed his new theory. He thought it would open the door to a new understanding of the universe. Einstein attacked this problem with two basic ideas. The first is that gravity shapes the universe. The large-scale structure of the universe is shaped by the force of gravity. And the other thing that Einstein assumed is that the universe is static. It doesn't change, and it is ageless. So in order to implement this idea that gravity shapes the universe, it has to be bound up with the curvature of space. 
because gravity is curved space. And in order to find a static ageless universe, Einstein had to introduce this cosmological term or dark energy. And now I will make the statement again that for the first time in human history, cosmology becomes a science. One of the hallmarks of science is that there is no authority in science. There are no authorities. The theories, models, and ideas of even the greatest scientists like Einstein are subject to experimental and ob observational texts. Theories, if it's a scientific theory or a scientific model, it has to be disprovable. There are no authorities. And in fact, that is what happened in 1929 when the cosmological theory, the cosmological model of probably the greatest scientist of the 20th century, one of the greatest scientists of all time, was shown to be wrong, disproved, by a basketball player. <laughs> now, this wasn't any old basketball player. This was a basketball player on the last decent athletic team of the University of Chicago. <laughs> the 1909 National Championship basketball team. And the forward on the 1909 National Championship basketball team you everyone's heard of, it was Edwin Hubble. After Edwin Hubble ended his basketball career, he became an astronomer, and in 1929, Hubble expanding by observation Einstein was wrong in his assumption that the universe is static. His cosmological model was overturned by the observations of Hubble, who showed that the universe is expanding, and scientists infer that the universe is not static, it's expanding, and if it's expanding, it's not ageless, it started with a bang. And this led to a cosmological model that we still use as a basis to study cosmology today, the Big Bang Theory. Now, the word theory is something that means different things to different people. I think the word theory means something different to scientists than it does to some of the general public who will say, well, that's, your, that's just your theory. A theory is something more than the imagination of somebody, conspiracy theories and, you know, that, that's ideas of people. But a scientific theory has to fit into a framework. It has to be testable. It has to explain a lot, an all-encompassing idea. So, you know, it, generally people will say, well, evolution, that's just a theory. You should consider all of the possibilities. The Big Bang is just a theory. You should consider all of the possibilities. I remind them that gravity is just a theory. And if you approach the edge of your roof, please consider all possibilities. <laughs> but the Big Bang, in fact, we know is more than a theory, much more than a theory. It, it is a television program. <laughs> Now, a theory has to do more than just account uh, for what's a, what we already know. It has to make predictions. One of the predictions of the Big Bang is that if the universe began with a hot state, a hot Big Bang, there should be a remnant, an afterglow of the enormous radiation that was present in the beginning of the universe. This was a prediction and this was, in fact, discovered in 1965 in the Nobel Prize winning work of Penzias and Wilson, who determined that the temperature of the universe everywhere is three degrees Kelvin. Nowhere is it zero degrees because of the fireball of the Big Bang. Everywhere the universe is three degrees Kelvin or minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you had eyes that were sensitive to microwave radiation, if you could see microwaves, 
Many of my students think you can see microwaves because when they turn on the microwave oven, there's a light inside, <laughs> but you're not seeing the microwaves, right? But if your eyes were sensitive to microwaves, you could see, it, see uh, that the universe is full of radiation at a temperature of three degrees, and again, the Big Bang is more than a theory. It's a television program. And in my community, among my friends, this is reality television. <laughs> we don't understand why people find it funny. Isn't that just reality? So I've described the Big Bang as being due to the work of Einstein, Hubble, and I mentioned Enzius and Wilson, but of course many other people contributed to the Big Bang. And I have started mentioning other people because last month I received an email. Uh, someone had seen on uh, the web a lecture I had given, and it told me, informed me that I am a horrible person. You know, I said, why is it that this poor person is never given his due? You should talk about other people. It's more interesting than the story of Hubble being a basketball player. This disturbed me. I asked my friends, does not mentioning other people make me a horrible person? And they said, no, that's not why you're a horrible person. <laughs> so I decided to mention some other people, Friedman, Lemaitre, De Sitter, Robertson Walker, Gamov, Alpha Herman. It's been a century of people working on cosmology and making contributions. If you want your name, I don't want to be a horrible person, if you want your name to appear there, see me after the talk. <laughs> so the universe that we see today is not the universe that Einstein expected to find. It's not an ageless, timeless, static universe. The universe today of high temperature and density, 13.78 thousand million years ago last Tuesday, and is expanding and cooling. It's evolving and dynamic. We live in an evolving universe. Now, in evolution, like paleontology or other evolution, evolution happens at a very slow rate, and we don't see evolution on a human time scale. But astronomy is lucky because we can directly observe the evolution of the universe by employing time machines. Astronomers have time machines. Paleontologists, evolutionary biologists, they can only talk about what the Earth was like 65, 70, 90 years ago, but astronomers have time machines. The time machines we have to study the universe are telescopes. Telescopes are time machines. Because of the finite velocity of light, the farther out in space we look, the further back in time we look. It takes light a while to reach us from distant objects. When we look at the sun, we're seeing the sun not as it exists the moment we see it, but as it existed in the past eight minutes ago, because it takes like eight minutes to reach out from the sun. If we look at a nearby bright star, we're looking at the star not as, as it exists in 2011, but as it existed perhaps 10 years ago, because typical bright stars we see are 10 or 20 light years away. The farther out in space we look, the further back in time we see. Things that are farther away appear younger. I always notice that people in the back of the room appear a little bit younger to me than people in the front. So the lesson is, if you want to appear young, don't stand too close to people. Try to stand far away. So look, using telescopes to look out in space and back in time, we can directly see the evolution of the universe. And when we look out in space and back in time and try to understand the evolution of the universe, we are struck with the aspect of the dark universe. 
The first part of the dark universe is dark matter. And the idea that uh, much of the universe is dark goes back to the 1930s and the work of the astronomer Fritz Zwicky. In 1933 and 1937, Zwicky looked at clusters of galaxies, regions of space that contain thousands of galaxies, and came to the conclusion, because of the way the galaxies move, that there must be a lot of mass holding this cluster of galaxies together. And there was much more mass than he could see in the form of stars or galaxies. Most of the mass in the cluster of galaxies, Zwicky determined in 1933 and 1937, was dark. I think this was a remarkable observation and a remarkable uh, result but for some reason, for 50 years or 40 years, people didn't really pay that much attention to it. They said, hmm, that's interesting. Anything else you want to tell us? It wasn't until the 1970s and the work of the American astronomer Vera Rubin that this idea of dark matter came to the forefront. This is the one graph you'll see. This is a graph that looked at an individual galaxy. And what Vera Rubin did was measure the rotational velocity, the orbital velocity, of stars about the center of the galaxy. This is the velocity of stars about the center of the galaxy. This is a number 100 kilometers per second. And she measured how that changes with distance from the center of the galaxy. And this point here is 20,000 light years. And if you measure how rapidly a star is orbiting about the center of the galaxy, you can determine the mass interior. Just as we can, we can determine the mass of the sun by measuring the rotation of the orbital velocity of the Earth about the sun. And if all of the mass in the galaxy was contained in stars, this is the curve that Vera Rubin would have expected to see. That stars that are farther from the center of the galaxy have a smaller orbital velocity, just as stars, uh, just as planets far from the sun have a smaller orbital velocity than planets close to the sun. It's just Kepler's third law of planetary motion. But that's not what Vera Rubin observed. She observed that the velocity does not increase, that it increases slowly, and there must be more mass to a galaxy than she can see in the form of stars, and that's what is known as dark matter. So when we look at a galaxy, we're not seeing the whole thing. We're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Most of the mass of a galaxy is invisible to us. So when we look at a galaxy, we're only seeing a part of the puzzle. There are other pieces of the puzzle that we don't see that we call dark, uh, we call dark matter. Now, we don't see dark matter. We don't see it in any way other than the effect that it has pulling the galaxy together, holding it together. If it wouldn't be for dark matter, galaxies are spinning so rapidly, if it wouldn't be for this extra matter holding it together, the stars in the galaxy would fly out into space. The galaxy would not be bound. So we can't see dark matter, but and occasionally, every month or so, in my office on the south side of Chicago, someone knocks on the door and walks in and t tells me excitedly, I can see dark matter. <laughs> I try to direct them to the medical center, ask them about their medication, why they're not taking it anymore. We don't see dark matter. But we can ask our computers to tell us what a galaxy would look like if we could see dark matter. So let's give dark matter a color. Let's color it purple and blue. 
And this is what a galaxy would look like. The galaxy that we see, the galaxy of stars, these beautiful, enormous images that we get from space telescopes and telescopes on the ground would just be that little yellow disk that's in the center, surrounded by a halo of dark matter that's dense, indicated by the red here around the galaxy, then the density becomes smaller, indicated by the purple, and smaller still, indicated by the blue. And the new, new computers suggest that there should be little clumps of dark matter around the galaxy. The galaxies are much larger than the enormous galaxy that we see. We don't know what this red and purple and blue stuff is. We don't know what the galaxy is made of. So there are missing pieces in the puzzle when we try to understand the nature of galaxies. So what could it be? Well, let's look at Einstein's equation of gravity, his theory of gravity, curved space is gravity, and it depends upon matter plus energy. The first thing you might say is perhaps Einstein didn't have the last word on gravity, and the, there's not really dark matter, we just infer there's dark matter. Perhaps Einstein's theory of gravity doesn't work on scales as large as a galaxy. <coughs> Recent observations have suggested, proving things is very difficult, but have a strong suggestion that Einstein's theory of gravity, and Newtonian gravity in fact, is adequate for, the, for the, something the size of the galaxy. So we don't think that is the answer. Another possibility that people have suggested is that perhaps there's more mass and we don't see this other stuff that the galaxy is made of because it's in the form of something that's hard to see with telescopes. Planets are hard to see with telescopes. You, you, we only see them with reflected light. And there are different types of planets. There are big gas planets. And my favorite type of planets, of course, are the rocky planets. It's <laughs> <laughs> just full of gigantic chunks of rock that we don't see. Or perhaps they are, the, the, the galaxy is full of, well, they used to be called dwarf stars. But I'm told at universities now we can't refer to dwarf stars. We refer to them as mass disadvantaged stars. <laughs> mass disadvantaged stars are also light disadvantaged. Perhaps there's just many, many, many very low mass stars in our galaxy that's just very dim. Or another possibility is perhaps our galaxy is full of black holes. Black holes do not emit light that we can see. Perhaps the dark matter is just black holes. Now, together, the planets, mass disadvantaged stars, and black holes go by the name of massive astronomical compact halo objects. I'll say that again. It rolls off your tongue. Massive astronomical compact halo objects or machos. The other possibility that we have thought about is that it's not machos, but it's weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs. <laughs> so is our galaxy and the mass of other galaxies dominated by machos or WIMPs? Oddly enough, the observations seem to point to the fact that WIMPs are stronger than machos. <laughs> Something that surprised a lot of people, but the best idea today doesn't mean it's right. This is a mystery. We don't know what the answer is. It wouldn't be a mystery. The best possible solution to this mystery of dark matter is that everywhere in the universe there are, there are weakly interactive massive particles, a new type of particle that was produced in the primordial soup. And the idea that early in the history of the universe, much earlier than the first second, in the history of the universe, particles like quarks and antiquarks got together, annihilated, and produced wimps and anti-wimps. And these wimps and anti-wimps are very weakly interacting. They're around us in our galaxy. They're in this room. 
We don't quite know their mass, but if this idea is correct, in every liter of space, there's probably three or four widths. Three weakly interacting massive particles in every liter of space. We don't see them, we don't taste them, but they're out there in space, if this idea is correct. So, this is a scientific theory. It's an idea. Theories and ideas and models have to be subject to experimental detection and observation and falsification. Otherwise, it's not a science. So, you say... You have this idea that quarks and anti-quarks make wimps and anti-wimps in the primordial soup. Why don't you build a big telescope and look out in space and back in time and see the wimps being produced? Unfortunately, we can't do that. We can look out in space and back in time only to 380,000 years after the bang. Because for the first 380,000 year history of our universe, the universe was so hot and so dense, it was opaque. We can't see through it. So no matter how large of a telescope we build, we can't look out in space, back in time, to a fraction of a second of the bang, back to the primordial soup to see the wimps and anti-wimps being produced. So we can't directly observe this happening in the primordial soup 13.78 billion years ago, but we can do something else that's almost as good, perhaps. We can make wimps today in soup factories that make primordial soup. We can recreate the conditions that have not existed in the universe for nearly 14 billion years by at particle accelerators by colliding particles together at very high energy. When we collide particles and accelerators at very high energy, we can recreate in a little region of space, in this case, at Fermi Lab, 35 miles west of Chicago, the conditions that were present a billionth of a second after the fact. And these are enormous machines. This ring is 4.26 miles in uh, circumference, and it's a tremendous achievement to accelerate particles to high energy, to collide them together, and produce the product of Fermilab, the primordial soup. <laughs> the product is primordial soup. And we can look for the wimps in the primordial soup by going back to this idea that in the early universe, this is the theory, that quarks and anti-quarks collided and produced wimps and anti-wimps. So this thing here is something, it's a depiction of something that's known as a Feynman diagram named after the great 20th century American physicist Richard Feynman, who had these idea of diagrams that we use in physics to try to understand the interactions of particles. Feynman drove around in a van where he painted Feynman diagrams on his van, and he was honored. It was a long time ago because the stamp was only 37 cents uh, with Feynman diagrams. So that is... This is a Feynman diagram showing a quark and anti-quark producing a wimp and an anti-wimp. Now, the accelerators do not have quarks that they can pick out and accelerate. They have protons and antiprotons, but inside the proton and antiproton, there are quarks and antiquarks. So if this idea is correct, we can use this Feynman diagram to predict that in an accelerator, a proton and antiproton will come together and collide and produce a quark and an antiquark that we won't be able to see. Well, how do we test that? Something comes together and collides and it produces something we don't see. So if you close your eyes, you know, you wouldn't see it. Well, 
You, we wouldn't see it even in the detector. But in fact, there is a way to see it because there's so much energy. If we have sufficient amount of energy, we can produce a jet of energy in the collision and look for a process that's proton plus antiproton making the WIMPs plus a jet. So the way this is being searched for at Fermi Lab and now at CERN is to collide protons and antiprotons together, producing a jet of particles that go off in one direction and nothing that goes off, nothing that we can detect that goes off in the other direction. Since the overall momentum has to add to zero, if you have something squirting out in one direction, the jet of energy squirting out in one direction, there has to be something in the other direction to balance it, and that would be a wimp. So you won't see the wimp. You would infer it exists by measuring the energy of all of the particles that, uh, that comes out of the other end. So this is something that people are looking for at CERN and at Fermilab today. So there are known ingredients in the primordial soup, gluons, photons, bosons, croutons, all these new elementary particles that are in the primordial soup. And there's a race to discover the secret ingredient for the primordial soup. That's the dark matter. There's another way we can prove or disprove this idea that wimps are the dark matter. We live in a sea of wimps. There are three wimps in this. If you take a snapshot of this leader, there's about three wimps in this leader. The wimps aren't just sitting there, though. They're passing through us with a velocity of 300 kilometers per second, about 200 miles per second. The wimps are just passing through us. We live in a sea of wimps. We don't detect them because they interact so weakly with uh, everything around us. So let's go back to our Feynman diagram. And now we're going to do something fancy with it. We're going to reduce, uh, we're going to reverse some of the arrows. According to the rules of Mr. Feynman, if you reduce the, if you <laughs> reverse, I don't know why I said you do, if of an arrow, you change a particle into an antiparticle. So I want to reverse this arrow, changing this from an anti wimp into a wimp, and I'm going to reverse this arrow, going in this direction, making this a quark. And this same Feynman diagram describes the scattering of a quark and a wimp. And of course, we don't have quark targets. The quarks are in protons. But this predicts that a wimp passing through us occasionally will hit a proton and nudge it a little bit, giving it a little bit of energy, a small amount of energy that we couldn't detect in our body but if we build a sensitive enough detector, we could see this. And there are maybe a dozen of these experiments all over the world that are underground to put it away from cosmic rays and other disturbances that are looking for wimps. And the nice thing about people looking for wimps is that they get to wear funny things. They wear helmets in case they get hit by a wimp. Uh, they wear little bunny costumes there. They wear gloves because they have to be a very pure, um, a very pure detector. And they even wear breathing apparatus just in case the wimp leaves behind a funny smell. <laughs> that's another type of dark matter, but that's... Uh... <laughs> so this is going on throughout the world. There's probably a dozen experiments throughout the world. And right now, people are underground looking for dark matter. There's a final way we can check this idea whether WIMPs are correct is by looking to the center of our galaxy with telescopes. If WIMPs are around us, they should be accumulating in the center of our galaxy. And when they accumulate in the center of a galaxy, we can go back to our basic Feynman diagram from the primordial soup, a quark and an anti-quark produces a WIMP and an anti-WIMP. 
if I re reverse all of those arrows, I have a process that describes a width and an anti-width coming together to annihilate into a quark. And an anti-quark, the quark and the anti-quark fragments into all sorts of particles. There's extra energy produced, so you could produce protons, antiprotons, electrons, positrons, gamma rays, x-rays, high energy particles known as neutrinos. And today there are, again, dozens of experiments that are looking at the galactic center for the result of WIMP annihilation today in the galactic center. My friends are flying balloons from Antarctica, satellites in space, uh, look, digging under the ice in the South Pole to put detectors looking for high energy neutrinos from WIMP annihilation, looking for the gamma rays from WIMP annihilation in various difficult to get to in inhospitable places in the world like Namibia or Arizona. <laughs> and they're looking for wimps. So far we have no definitive evidence whether the wimp idea is correct or not. There are some very interesting hints and in early results from accelerators, from direct detection, from uh, satellite experiments that perhaps we're seeing the signal of a wimp. We don't know, probably in another couple of years we'll be in a better position to know, but right now it's a very exciting time to be studying this. But there's more to the dark side than wimps. When we again look at what we do see in the universe, we measure the expansion of the universe and what was discovered in 1998 is that the expansion of the universe is not slowing down. We would expect the expansion of the, of the universe to slow down because gravity is pulling everything back together. The expansion velocity of the universe seems to be speeding up. One possible, and this is known as dark energy, that seems to be pulling space apart causing the expansion. Now, one possible explanation for dark energy goes back to Einstein's theory, curved space is matter plus energy, and bright idea after all in 1917 when he proposed the cosmological constant, maybe for the wrong reason. In 1929, Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe, and Einstein said, oops, Never mind, I take back this idea of a cosmological constant. He called it my biggest blunder. He didn't realize that 64 years later, astronomers would find evidence that perhaps there is a cosmological constant. So there's a big lesson there. You should never admit you're wrong. <laughs> Einstein could have been famous but instead, he said, no, 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 well, I must be wrong. Now, if there is a cosmological constant, it amounts to a mass density of empty space that I think of the, as the unbearable lightness of nothing, a mass density of 10 to the minus 30 grams per cubic centimeter, and if you're not familiar with grams of cubic centimeter, it's point bunch of zero seven pounds per cubic inch of space. Every cubic inch of space, if this is the answer, has a weight, a mass, of that many pounds. Now, how can empty space by itself weigh something? And that is uh, what I'll close on tonight it's the Zen part of this lecture talking about nothing. I would like to say four things about nothing. Nothing is something. Um, a little Zen chants, please. Nothing has energy. Nothing, thank you, nothing is hidden. Nothing matters. The Zen-like aspects of nothing. First, let me just say a word about nothing is something. 
When I teach at Chicago, I ask my students to close their eyes and think about nothing. Some of them have been doing it the entire term, <laughs> anticipating this moment when they think about nothing. So thinking about nothing, we could imagine a region of space, a blue volume of space, where we remove all of the matter, all the molecules, all of the air. There's no matter there. We could imagine cooling it to absolute zero, removing all of the energy, all of the temperature. So we remove all matter and energy. What's left behind we call the vacuum or nothing. But what we can't remove is quantum uncertainty. According to the laws of quantum mechanics, at every point in space, in the vacuum, in nothing, it's possible for a particle and antiparticle to come out of the vacuum, existing for a brief instant of time, before they annihilate and disappear back into the vacuum. Nothing is something. And nothing has energy. In modern physics, the quantum vacuum all around us has a potential energy, not an electric potential or a magnetic potential, but a Higgs potential. And it is this Higgs potential that gives mass to particles like electrons and Ws and Zs and quarks. And um, an excitation of this Higgs potential is the long-sought Higgs boson. We haven't discovered the Higgs boson at Fermilab, but we have seen the Higgs boson. <laughs> Pretty massive. This Higgs potential energy is 256 billion electron volts at every point in space. Nothing is hidden. My friends who are string theorists tell me that there are extra dimensions of space that are hidden. That's not true. I don't have any friends who are string theorists, but if I did, <laughs> if I did, they would tell me that at every point in space there are extra dimensions, and these extra dimensions are balled up really tight and something squeezing it and holding it really small. There must be some energy associated holding together these extra dimensions. Finally, nothing matters. Dark energy, if it exists, will determine the ultimate fate of the universe. If there is dark, only dark matter in the universe, the universe could expand for another few dozens of billion years, then recollapse into a big crunch, or it could expand forever, ever slowing, but always expanding. But if there is dark energy, then the universe will expand forever at an ever-increasing velocity. And the galaxies that we see now, the great beautiful universe that we observe, will recede away from us so rapidly that eventually we won't be able to see it. And uh, we would not see any other galaxies in the universe. This is why we have to do astronomy now. The galaxies are getting farther away. Let's see them now. So nothing is something. Nothing has energy. Nothing is hidden. And nothing matters. The American poet Walt Whitman said to me, every hour of the light and dark is a miracle. Every cubic inch of space is a miracle. In every cubic inch of space, there is a miracle. In every cubic inch of space, there's the afterglow of the Big Bang, the radiation from the Big Bang. There's dark matter, dark energy, virtual particles, the Higgs potential, extra dimensions. Every cubic inch of space is a miracle. We don't know the nature of dark matter and dark energy, but I'm confident that in the next decade, we will learn a lot about dark matter and dark energy because we have remarkable tools that are coming online to allow us to study the nature of dark matter and dark energy. This is a photograph of a place at CERN, a high energy physics laboratory. This is a person here to give you a scale where they'll produce primordial soup that's hotter and denser than the primordial soup at Fermilab, perhaps one day soon you'll read that they have discovered evidence for a wimp at the Large 
Hadron Collider. Looking out in space and back in time would take a giant leap in the next 10 years when a new generation of giant telescopes are built. This is one that we're involved with, the Giant Magellan Telescope. This is a person here to give you a scale. And this giant telescope will have sharper images, images that are 10 times sharper than the Hubble Space Telescope, and it will have a collecting area that's 100 times the Hubble Space Telescope, allowing us to look farther out in space and further back in time. When Einstein's new theory of gravity opened the door to a new understanding of the universe, he expected to find an ageless static universe of stars embedded in a single galaxy. What we've discovered since is a 14 billion year old evolving universe of galaxies embedded in dark matter and dark energy. We've discovered the mysteries of the dark universe. Einstein, I think, would be happy about these mysteries. Einstein said the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. To Einstein, it was the source of all true art and science. He thought that those of us who are strangers to mystery are as good as dead. Our eyes are closed. Cosmologists today are no stranger to mystery. 95% of the universe is a mystery to us as we try to study dark matter and dark energy and solve the mysteries of the dark universe. Thank you very much. We'll start here and then go there. Yeah. Well, Chris, you, you talked briefly about Fermi and Circa. Um, my question is, I, I know we're trying to recreate what happened in that billionth of a second right after the Big Bang, and hopefully it's going to be a big boson. Okay. Countries have spent billions of dollars, France, Switzerland, even the United States, especially in CERN. What, what do we expect to do with that once we find it? What do we think we're going to find that's so valuable? How are we going to... So Okay. Use that to our advantage. So, so the question has to do with the use of the research that's done at accelerators. Uh, so it, the, the new accelerator at CERN costs $5 billion or $4 billion. Now, there are many countries that are contributing to this. That's right in that check. And uh, it will, it, I think it will discover the Higgs boson. It may discover dark matter which would be a great discovery. We'll learn what the universe is made of. So it'll be a great advance in human knowledge. And I think that's a great reason to do it. But there's another reason to do it, and that has to do with the same reason that we do hard things in the world today. We send people out in space. That's incredibly hard. We put space telescopes out there. We build accelerators. We do really difficult things. When we do difficult things, it pushes people to invent and come up with new ideas. So let's say it costs $5 billion to fund CERN and new accelerators for a decade. CERN was a place where something was invented known as, maybe you've heard of it, the World Wide Web. Heard www, HTT, that all that technology, that knowledge came out of CERN. Now, how much contribution, eventually it would have been discovered and used, invented by somebody, but perhaps it came, let's say, three years earlier because CERN was there and needed it. So how much has three years of the World Wide Web contributed to the world economy? I would guess it's more than the money that was put into CERN. There are other examples like that. Fermilab, when they built the superconducting accelerator, in the 70s pushed the invention and in industry to make superconducting cable that's used in MRI machines. So if you have an MRI, part of the technology of that was invented first, developed first, and pushed by high energy accelerators. And you can do the same thing for the space program. It's not Tang or Corningware. 
but you know, it, doing hard things pushes people to make new invention, making things bigger and faster, and eventually it pays off, sometimes in an indirect way. And there's a famous uh, say, there's a famous story that when Michael Faraday in the ninth, middle of the 19th century invented the first electric motor, the first induction motor, uh, the chancellor of the exchequer at that time, I think it's who it was, Gladstone, and just really said, that's very nice, sir, but what good is it? <laughs> and Faraday answered, someday you'll tax it. <laughs> so uh, so that, that's a long-winded answer to a very good question. So in addition to contributing to human knowledge, it contributes to technology and makes our life better. And going back in 1920, in the 1920s, there were a group of a couple of dozen physicists throughout the world studying quantum mechanics. Well, what good was that? It wasn't until, 50, it wasn't until 40 or 30 years later that people knew how to use that to make transistors, to make lasers, which has revolutionized and changed our life. Uh, we talked quite a bit about this idea that quarks and antiquarks annihilate the news and wimps and anti wimps and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I had not heard that idea before. Are you really sure about that? So the question is, am I sure that quarks and antiquarks annihilate into wimps and anti wimps? Uh, we are not sure about that. I wanted to emphasize in the talk that this is an idea. It, dark matter is a mystery. We, if, if we knew what the answer was, it wouldn't be a mystery. This is the leading uh, idea for the explanation of dark matter, and it's testable, and we'll know the answer, I think, in 10 years. So 10 years from now, I'll come back, I promise, and either say, uh, look at all this evidence we have. It's pretty conclusive that quarks and antiquarks annihilate and wimps are the answer. Or I'll say, remember the story I told you 10 years? I have a better idea now. So we don't know. And um, we don't know it's true. Uh, it's, it's the best idea we have. Traveling in space and develop matter, the dark matter, and spread it out as well. Yeah, well, people. Well, I end up with some wine if there's something out there that just the uh, particle can be used to cause some of the silicon energy. People talk about that, in particular dark energy. So, in every liter of space, there's a million electrons of dark energy. Do you know how many liters of space are out there? <laughs> If we could drill, baby, drill the dark energy, <laughs> there'd be a lot of energy available. But no one can figure out how to extract this energy from nothing. So I, I never say never, but uh, don't invest money yet in dark energy. <laughs> <laughs> I just said it was a simulation of what the dark matter was that would influence the structure of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, and earlier you had pointed out the, uh, in that picture you had the, the halo extending well beyond the, the visible galaxy. And, mm -hmm. uh, as, as you pointed out, yeah, as you pointed out earlier, the uh, orbits are normally uh, influenced by the mass inside the yes. So why why is the structure beyond the invisible galaxy required? So the uh, dark matter goes out to distances beyond where we can see stars, but we can detect uh, uh, individual atoms that are out there in a gas orbiting the uh, orbiting the galaxy. <coughs> And through 21 centimeter uh, radiation or something like that, we can see the velocity of the hydrogen. And we can also use a technique that's known as gravitational lensing. The dark matter, there's so much dark matter that it distorts space around it. And so it distorts the images that are behind it. It's a little bit more technical, but it's some, we have techniques that we can use 
that we think the dark matter extends out that far. Yes, you know, a lot of days, the space shuttle endeavor is going to uh, launch the space station's primary payload is the alpha magnetic spectrometer, a science instrument that uh, has been uh, designed to detect dark matter, dark energy. Anything about that? Yes. So um, there will be, of, of the experiments that I showed you, that some are a satellite experiment, some are balloons, some are telescopes from Earth, uh, there are many of them operating now, and then in a couple of weeks, there's a schedule, 11 days, 11 days, 11 days, it's scheduled to launch another experiment. It's launched and never delayed, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> to launch another experiment, the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which will test some of the ideas looking, among the things they will do is to look for some of the products that could be produced by annihilation of wind in the galactic center. So I couldn't show you images of all of the ongoing experiments, and there are many more future experiments that are planned. So this may, in fact, find evidence of annihilation of dark matter in the galactic center, and we look forward to what that uh, will see, because there's evidence of an anomalous flux of high-energy positrons. There's also another experiment that sees high-energy um, uh, High energy electrons, so the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which will be carried as a payload on the shuttle to space station, may uh, either confirm or show that is not correct. Yes, sir. Uh, when you talk about reversing the direction of uh, the collision with the wind and force um, and changing out protons, you said that a wind and a proton could produce another wind and a proton and some additional energy? Yes. So, so how does that work? Because you only put, you know, I, I would think that there has to be some kind of loss in there to get energy in such well, right? It, it depends on the mass of the wimp. So one thing that will happen, for instance, if a wimp and anti-wimp annihilate, you, could, you would convert the rest mass energy that's in the wimp until it, to energy and mass of other particles. Depending upon how much rest mass energy there is in the wimp and anti-wimp pairs, you could create dozens of other types of particles. And for the production in accelerators, these are very high energy protons and antiprotons that are colliding together. So there's extra energy around to produce other types of particles. Now for the wimps that are around us today that are scattering with protons in these detectors, the wimps have a velocity of only about 200 miles per second, really pitifully small. Uh, so there's not a lot of energy that will be given to the proton in, in that. Professor, you, you mentioned uh, just recently, I know CERN's operation will be fired up the Large Hadron Collider. Why is it going to take years to get results? And for smashing protons, why don't we know instantaneously what we're going to find? Let's take this a um, I know it's awful simplistic, but I'm just curious why it takes that long to get results. So it's a, the, the WIMPs are weakly interactive. It's very hard to produce them, and it's very hard to, to detect their presence. We don't detect them directly, but to detect their presence. There's many, many other things that are more likely to happen than produce a weakly interacting particle. So it's very rare. When a quark and anti-quark come together, almost always it makes something other than a wimp and an anti-wimp. But in the early universe, you had a lot of quarks and anti-quarks around, so you made enough of them. So it's a very rare event, and you have to have a little patience uh, to wait till you really have evidence. And uh, before people jump up and say, I've discovered what the universe is made of, they want to make, sh make sure that they have the correct statistics and then tested everything else. Um, I would just wanted to know if you wanted to comment on the recent discovery at, at Fermi Lab that they've been talking about. No. <laughs> it's not a wimp, I don't think. Yes, sir. Uh, you talk about the dark energy being 100 million electron volts per cubic centimeter. 
Now, since space is expanded, we can cap that in some time. It should have been like more than that. Yeah, so if. If it is, well, that, that's, a, that's a question we're trying to answer. Uh, if it is Einstein's cosmological constant, if it really is a constant, a new constant of nature, then the energy per cubic inch per volume of the vacuum is the same. As the universe expands, there's more space being created, so there's more energy around. Uh, but if it is a cosmological constant, the, that component of the energy budget is the same for all time. Well, <clears throat> what would be the implication if time itself were quantized into some tiny discrete units? And is there any evidence, speculation, or does anyone care to investigate that? Uh, the question has to do with the quantization of time, and since space and time is relative, you can also talk about the quantization of space. Okay. I don't know Okay. It, it, it may not be able to be erased either, right? So, um, most, most, <laughs> most physicists think that, in fact, space and time have some quantum nature but they think that the quantum of time is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Uh, that, you know, it's not a smooth second hand that goes around, but it takes jumps of 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Decimal point followed by 43 zeros and then a one. And that the quantum nature of space, that space is quantized, on a scale of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So on scales smaller than this, our classical picture of space itself just falls apart. We don't know what space is. And on time shorter than this, I don't know what time is. Now, those are just words. It's clear it has some dramatic importance in our understanding of the origin of the universe, of the Big Bang itself. But exactly how to do that awaits some quantum theory of gravity, which uh, I see some young kids here. It's up to you to come up with this. We, we David and I have run out, with, run out of ideas. <laughs> what would be fundamentally in doubt about asking the question, what would be the, given that the, at least in, in the realm of the world, um, as I say, the energy of a photon is equal to h mu, yes. related to the wavelength of the photon. Imagine that the entire mass energy of the universe were initially, some, there's a picture of something else, to be a single photon. The numbers to calculate a dimension that's exceptionally small, smaller than that. Is that fundamentally invalid calculation? No. No, I think it's suggested. I don't know what it suggests, but it's suggested. The time it suggests is the equivalent time basis that suggests something like 10 to the minus 143 seconds, which is ridiculously small compared to that. So um, I think uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'm happy to ask some questions later, but perhaps we should do it sort of privately so people, most people can uh, leave in sort of a polite way. <laughs> thank you. announcements before everybody leaves. Uh, first off, there is a sign-in sheet, which is, uh, or there were actually four sign-in sheets, so I do we need to get those back. And then, um, there are some handouts out there about the physics program and about the American Astronomical Society. And also, um, uh, people who park in the visitor lot, uh, I guess they have tokens at the uh, department uh, as you go out uh, in the Bayou building. And for people who are uh, either taking this course for credit, uh, I need you to stay after. And for people who are on advisory board, uh, you can stay after if you'd like. But uh, everybody else, thank you very much for coming out. And thank hopefully you. we'll be seeing you again in the future. Bye.
other than we are on Facebook too, if anybody wants future information about what we're doing here. Oh, let me uh, uh, close out. Okay, great. Is there really a good plan in the world? Yeah, it's hard to hold it. Uh, my teacher is answering the very good question. Tell me something else. 